from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our final talk before the break is from Stephen Robertson, who is director of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media and professor of history at the George Mason University. He will tell a story about Digital Harlem, a project that won the American Historical Association's Roy Rosenzweig Prize for Innovation in Digital History and the ABC CLIO Online History Award of the American Library Association in 2010. You're on, Stephen. Good morning. <laughs> Applause at the beginning. Uh, I just want to start with a quick shout out to the wonderful team of people here at the Library of Congress who brought us all here today and a fascinating group of people they've brought. I'm going to go back to maps, which Ed showed you a lot of at the beginning, to talk about data and place. Historical sources are full of data about places and locations. The spatial data is not very intelligible in textual form and even when extracted and organised in tabular form, it really doesn't tell us a lot. It's hard to discern the story that it has to tell us. Now, mapping has been around for a long time as a tool for making sense of the spatial data, but it's only really with the advent of web mapping that it's become accessible to a wider range of people. You used to have to go find the GIS person in your university to make you a map for a project, and that was going to be the one map that you did if you had the months to do that. The web has fundamentally transformed that. And the project that I'm here to talk about today owes its form to the launch of Google Maps in 2005. Shane White put together a team of four historians at the University of Sydney, of which I was a junior member, to do a study of everyday life in New York City's Harlem neighbourhood in the 1920s. Our key sources for this, to get beyond the political and um, artistic elite that dominate accounts of Harlem was New York City's two black newspapers, The Age and The Amsterdam News, and the records of the Manhattan District Attorney. Now, I was in that project because I'd used those legal records in my dissertation, and I knew from the dissertation that they were full of information about where things happened that I'd found no way to use and analyse when I did the dissertation. So what I suggested as my contribution to this larger project was an effort to map our sources. Now, when we got funding for the project in 2004, the technology for doing that was ArcGIS. And I went away to find collaborators at the University of Sydney, our experts in ArcGIS, to make that happen. And at Sydney, at that time, it was the Archaeological Computing Laboratory. However, the problem with ArcGIS in 2004 was that it was not possible to use it on the web. It wouldn't run on our beloved Macintosh computers. And it simply was, as it still is, far too hard to master and far too complex to make it worth using to analyse the qualitative data that we had. So in, thankfully with the launch of Google Maps in 2005 and thanks to Damien Evans, one of our team who created a hack between our database and Google Maps, we launched Digital Harlem in 2009 as a web-based form of mapping. As with any large digital project, there's a whole team of people behind that, and before I say anything more, I want to acknowledge all of those people, in addition to the ones that I've already named, a team of historians, graduate research assistants, technologists of various kinds, and almost a million dollars of Australian government money, um, which always amuses people. But the Australian government, at least in the early 2000s, was interested in funding innovative scholarship, even about black neighbourhoods thousands of miles away. Now, Digital Harlem was one of the first historical web mapping projects, and one of the first digital history projects to shift from what the Valley of the Shadow was really interested in doing, digitising material, creating online collections, towards visualising those sources. Now, better technologies now exist for web mapping projects. Nevertheless, Digital Harlem remains a useful starting point for thinking about mapping as a means of making sources more accessible, more visual and more useful. The contrast here is with search, with accessing search sources through a database. I think Mitchell Whitelaw's formulation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, captures this best. Search is ungenerous, demanding a query and returning only the terms you enter. 
withholding information about the structure and materials available and filtering out any alternative hypotheses. Visualizations, by contrast, are generous, rich, browsable interfaces that reveal the scale and complexity of the data behind them and provide a context, a context that enriches the exploration and analysis of that data. So Digital Harlem is not an interface to a collection of forces. Thanks to copyright, licensing and restrictions imposed by archives, it's not possible for us, even if we'd wanted to, which we didn't, to offer access to the sources on which the site draws. But those restrictions do not prevent the creation of data from those sources, which is what Digital Harlem contains. Information about events, an ill-fated tennis tournament in this case, about people, and to a much lesser extent about, uh, sorry, to a much lesser extent about people, a lot about places. It's worth noting that those of us who work on the 20th century and beyond encounter this problem with access to sources far more often than our colleagues who work in earlier periods. We need to be talking more about the way in which restrictions on access to sources shape the kind of digital projects we can do on the 20th century and how creating data is a way of getting access to material that's otherwise under copyright. To create data, however, requires a different engagement with sources than humanities scholars typically have. Whereas, to use Miriam Posner's words, we usually immerse ourselves in our sources, dive in, understand them from within. To create data is to extract information and features from sources requiring a decomposition of a subject or object into attributes and variables. If there are now an increasing range of computational tools to do that extraction for you, the data that we gathered for Digital Harlem was done by hand, and because of the problems of access to digitised newspapers and the limits of ACR, is still a process that needs to be done by hand. So myself and the team of research assistants who appeared briefly on the screen recorded details of every location and every event um, associated with a case, location in those legal records, that I was talking about, and in the Harlem's two black newspapers. And crucially, in a way that Ed was alluding to, not just information from the news stories, but information from every section of the newspapers. The fraternal reports, the church records, the sports pages. There's far more information and far more spatial data in newspapers than we're used to thinking about when we rolled the microfilm through and looked for the news stories that were part of that. We organised that information into a data model, entered it into a database and geocoded it so that it could be mapped. Now the metaphor that we commonly use to describe that process, mining, sits awkwardly with humanities scholars concerned with development of empathy, with an appreciation of the position of a personal group or the qualities of an object. It sets up a sense of creating data as somehow dehumanising. Mapping data can somehow mitigate that consequence, can align with an orientation towards care of data, one element of which, as articulated by Bethany Nowitzki, is an appreciation of context, interdependence and vulnerability. Maps as a visualisation express this relationship of parts, one to another and to many to a greater whole. Mapping data, mapped data is seen in its geographical context. Enriched in digital Harlem by the use of a historical map layer, a Bromley real estate atlas which shares a lot of the information and qualities of the better known Sanborn fire insurance maps. It provides building footprints, information on the height of those buildings, the material they're made out of, whether they have shops or stores in them. What it does most dramatically in terms of the maps that we're used to looking at in historical scholarship is fill in the spaces on a street map. And in that way, this base layer literally divides, helps to subdivide and divide Harlem into multiple smaller places and to give some indication of how those places interact. And if you know anything about the history of Harlem in the 1920s, I chose this block because on the corner is a Renaissance ballroom and casino, the site of a lot of dances and entertainment and basketball games, next to the establishment Abyssinian Blackfist Church, one of the mainline middle class moral racial uplift centres of Harlem, and the hall to the right of that was the former headquarters of Marcus Garvey's Black Nationalist UNIA. A very interesting gathering of people walking down those blocks in a way that we don't appreciate without this kind of level 
full of data. One of the very exciting things going on right here at the Library of Congress is the digitisation of fa Sanborn fire insurance maps, which is going to put these incredibly rich sources into people's hands, make them freely accessible, transform the kind of historical mapping projects we can do by adding this incredibly rich layer of data about what the place is like. Layers of different data and hence large quantities of data can be combined on a single map, providing an image of the complexity of the past. And I'm going to come back to this really complex looking map. You can examine maps of sources at different scales, make comparisons, discover relationships by visually detecting spatial patterns that remain hidden in those texts and tables that we started with. Now, mapping data has become an increasingly common form of interface for a lot of digital collections. But too often those projects map only a single collection of material. That approach taps really only a small part of the power of mapping. Geographic location provides a means to integrate material from a wide range of disparate sources. So what's important about assigning a geographic reference to data, as Karen Kemp puts it, is that it then becomes possible to compare that characteristic, event, phenomenon, etc., with others that exist, that exist or have existed in the same geographic space. What were previously unrelated facts become integrated and correlated. The power of maps to bring disparate things together is where we really need to be going with them as a technology. Used in this way, the geospatial web can help us capture the confluence of multiple rhythms that Henry Leferb argues make up everyday life. So this is one of my go-to examples for talking about ha Harlem in the 1920s. It's a map of nightlife during Prohibition using data from newspapers, undercover investigations, legal records. It shows the venues which drew car crowds to Harlem, the nightclubs, the speakeasies, and the venues that black residents opened in their apartments, known as buffet flats, catering exclusively to blacks. The map highlights the different geographies of those venues, and in particular the clustering of buffet flats in sections away from the other venues, away from whites, and drew our attention to how blacks developed spaces apart from whites as they flocked to Harlem's nightlife in the 1920s. Now, why this map captures some of how prohibition shaped nightlife and leisure in Harlem, it's only a partial map of the commercialised leisure available in the neighbourhood. Digital Harlem lets you create that context by adding dance halls, theatres, pool rooms, the halls that hosted basketball games and boxing bouts, and then you can add to those commercial venues and need to to understand nightlife all of the places where non-commercial leisure took place in Harlem in this period. Meetings of church groups, fraternal lodges, community organisations and social clubs. You end up with this incredibly complex map, social clubs, incredibly complex map which highlights fundamentally just how a small a segment of leisure and nightlife in Harlem actually appears in discussions focused on prohibition which defines the way that we understand what Harlem was like in the 1920s. In regards to mapping events rather than places, this is one of the first maps we created, Arrests for Numbers in 1925, which gave our research a new focus. It shows in the first instance the sheer pervasiveness of numbers gambling, which is a picture that a multitude of sources reinforced in Harlem, and it's one reason why Shane White, Stephen Garten, Graham White and I wrote a book about the wide-ranging economic and cultural role of numbers gambling in Harlem is one of the outcomes of our collaboration. Zooming in to that map highlights how placing bets was woven into everyday life. Arrests occurred on street corners as residents bet on their way to work, in the businesses lining the avenues as they went shopping and ran errands, and in their homes on the cross streets as numbers runners went door to door collecting bets. Our original concept for Digital Harlem also included mapping individual lives, but assembling enough data to reveal more than a single moment of an individual's life proved beyond our resources. However, we did generate maps for a handful of people based on information on their residence, work and leisure in probation and parole records. Those maps make visible the extent to which the lives of Harlem's residents were not bounded by the neighbourhood make clear that the census data that we commonly rely on to determine where people lived ultimately only tells us where they slept. 
So, for example, during the five years that Morgan Thompson was on probation, his work as a labourer took him not only outside Manhattan, but to the Bronx, Queens and Brooklyn. We've used lines linking residents with the workplaces and other places that people frequented while at their address to suggest their movement through the city. The geography of work was often different for women. Annie Dillard, like the majority of Harlem women in the workforce, found paid employment as a domestic servant in homes on the Upper West Side, hotels in Midtown, and in a laundry in Lower Manhattan. The newest version of Digital Harlem adds a timeline to this to understand how these lives evolved. Two strikingly different geographies, two strikingly distant reminders that living in a city is not living in the neighbourhood. It's moving across the city in a way that we don't often place African Americans in places like New York. Now, for all the maps that we feature on the site and that we discuss in our scholarship, much of the usefulness and impact of Digital Harlem comes from how it allows users to make their own maps, to visualise the data that interests them rather than being constrained to what interests the, the site's curators. That capacity highlights that these maps are exploratory, not illustrative, that they raise questions rather than answering them. But the site itself, unfortunately, offers limited help in making sense of a map and the data it visualises. That design is in keeping with the original conception of the site, which was as a, as a research tool for those of us collaborating on the original project. When we decided to share the site, we added some material about the places and events featured on the site and on the individuals whose lives can be mapped. And we created a blog linked to the site with posts about additional maps of places and events, such as traffic accidents in this example, that incorporate additional material like photographs. Unfortunately, those after-the-fact efforts can only go so far. Creating a real context for understanding the data in Digital Harlem is a project in its own right that will require a wholesale redesign of the site. And it's one of the things that we need to think about, the difference between producing sites that are research tools for people who understand the data at some level and sites that are shared and are going to be used by people who don't bring the researcher's understanding to the site. Now, an emerging offer, uh, option for making that data more accessible and useful is to use what's in Digital Harlem as the basis for a spatial narrative rather than simply a map. I'm currently exploring that approach for a project on the 1935 Harlem riot for which we're creating another version of Digital Harlem based on that single year. By the 1930s, there's a much greater wealth of information about life in Harlem than there is in the 1920s. Now, a platform like the widely used StoryMap.js, which creates a, li a linear single path through a map, cannot effectively tell the story of a complex event like the riot, in which multiple things happen at any given time. Neither, for that matter, can following the timeline on Digital Harlem let you understand what is going on in the riot. Neatline, a mapping plugin for Omeka, which um, Ed was talking about earlier, gives some scope for more complex storytelling. And I've created a prototype narrative of the riot just to think about... There we go. Just to think about what's possible. What I really like about Neatline is that the timeline slider at the bottom of that image provides a means of navigating the exhibit. Dragging it not only changes the points that appear on the map, it also alters the waypoints visible on the right. While points display information on particular events, waypoints, waypoints can be used to explore broader arguments which can be grouped together rather than being tied to a single point on the timeline. What that means is that it gives you some flexibility in how a narrative is read. You can roll over each waypoint in a group and ex or explore them in a sequence or out of sequence. Each waypoint can be associated with a zoom level on a specific location. Clicking on a series of waypoints can thus move you around a map. And you can annotate those waypoints, attach them to polygons and lines, as I have in this prototype, to draw attention to the analysis of space and my understanding of what's going on in the riot, to movement, direction, proximity, connection, and patterns. Used in that way, annotations shift some of the argument into visual form. And that's ultimately where I think we're going with the kinds of visualizations we've been making in maps. That the future direction in visualizing data using maps that this prototype points to 
is the capacity to more extensively and dynamically integrate maps and narratives, to visually combine data and interpretation while retaining the orientation towards putting data in context, which to me is the most powerful thing that mapping lets us do. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.